Okay, what's up guys? Welcome back. This is going to be another practice questions, high yield practice questions for pants and EOR prep. Today's going to be dermatology section. So with this I did a little bit differently where I'm actually going to be giving the picture as I put pictures in ahead of time and uh, so you can identify what the condition is via the picture and then have a few following questions about that specific condition. So it's going to be more of a visual presentation here um, than normal because uh, obviously we need to know what the dermatologic conditions actually look like. For, for a lot of them as that could be uh, as that could be part of the question. So first one, what is this condition? What are the four main pathophysiologic mechanisms of this condition? Which type heals with scarring? And what is the initial treatment? What is the next step if it's moderate? And then what is the step if it is severe of this condition? So this is going to be acne vulgaris, of course. The pathophysiologic mechanisms, how I remember them, is HIPS, H-I-P-S, HIPS. So hyperkeratinization is one of them. Inflammation, propionobacterium acnes, acnes is the bacteria that can cause this. And also sebaceous production is one of the pathophysiologic mechanisms. So that's HIPS. Um, which type he heals with scarring? That's going to be nodular or cystic, typically scars. So nodular acne or cystic acne can scar. For mild uh, acne, you can do azelaic acid. Um, as well as benzoyl peroxide, retinoids, and topical antibiotics. That's all for mild. If it is moderate acne, then you can do an oral antibiotic, and that can be doxycycline or minocycline. And if it's severe, you can do isotretinoin. So that's isotretinoin, not tretinoin, but isotretinoin. A couple more questions. What is the mechanism of action of isotretinoin? So it's important to know what that is. And what requirements must be satisfied to take this uh, medication? So it's important to know some of the side effects of isotretinoin and what patients actually have to do in order to take this medication. So that's going to be the mechanism of isotretinoin is works on all four pathophysiologic mechanisms. So again, that's HIPS. Hyperkeratinization, inflammation, propionobacterium acnes, and sebaceous overactivity. It is teratogenic, isotretinoin, and you need two pregnancy tests prior and monthly while on it. So two pregnancy tests prior and monthly while on it. You also need two forms of contraception and you must sign the I pledge. It's also important to know that isotretinoin increases triglycerides and cholesterol as well. So what is this condition next? So you see these telangiectasias on the cheeks and a little bit on the nose, very red. What is this condition? Described as papulopustules sometimes. What is this condition? What is this condition? So this is a variation of it. What is this condition called? And it's marked by cutaneous edema. What is this condition? What are the triggers for this condition or both of them? And what is the treatment overall? So this is going to be rosacea. So remember the top picture was rosacea. They have, they'll have telangiectasias, which are like tiny blood vessels showing on the surface of the skin. Facial flushing. And also it's in response to triggers like alcohol, hot or cold weather, hot baths drinks, sun exposure, and also spicy food. The second picture, this one here with the nose there, is called rhinophyma. It's a variation of rosacea. And for that one, you can do laser therapy. Otherwise, metronidazole is the treatment. So it's important to know metronidazole is the treatment for rosacea. And for the facial erythema, you can also do bromodidine, which is an alpha-2 agonist. So just for that symptom, the facial erythema, you can do bromodidine. But again, metronidazole is the treatment unless you have the rhinophyma where you can do the laser therapy. Okay, next one, what is this treatment? Or what is this uh, condition here? As you can see, these little hair follicles sticking out, very red. Parafollicular papules or pustules would be a description of this. What is this condition called? What is the most common bacteria that leads to this condition? How do we treat this condition? And what is most common if they're in a hot tub? What is the most common cause if they're in a hot tub? So a few important questions there. So it's going to be folliculitis, of course. You can see the hair follicle is actually infected. So there's a hair follicle, and then there's the pus around it in a sort of um, pimple-like formation around it. So that's folliculitis. Staph aureus is the most common cause overall. We can do topical mupiracin, which uh, is effective against staph aureus. So again, staph aureus overall, topical mupiracin, and then pseudomonas aeruginosa is most common hot tub. So that's hot tub folliculitis and Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the most common for that one. Next one, what is this? 
So what is this? So it's classically described as target lesions with a dusky central area or blister, a pale ring of edema in an erythematous halo. So target lesions, and they have three, um, three zones in them. Dusky as well. What is this condition here? What type of reaction is this? We have to know what type of reaction this is. What are the precipitating factors for this condition? What are the precipitating factors? And what are the two different manifest, two different classifications and how are they different? So that might give it away. There's two different classifications for this condition here. And how are they actually different? So that's going to be erythema multiform. Erythema multiform is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. And some of the causes, how I remember it, is MASH PP. So mycoplasma, allopurinol, sulfa drugs, herpes, which is the most common, and pheno phenytoin and phenobarbital, so P and P. Phenytoin, phenobarbital, also mycoplasma again, allopurinol, sulfa, and herpes, which is the most common. And that's for erythema multiform. Um, so there's two different types, two different classifications rather. And one is erythema multiform minor and erythema multiform major. So erythema multiform minor is no mucosal involvement. So there's no mucosal involvement. And major has mucosal involvement. But also remember, both have a negative Nikolsky sign. So we remember Nikolsky sign is that when you're pressing on the skin with um, like lateral force, it would just shear the skin right off. So a negative Nikolsky sign is when you do that, the, the skin doesn't come off at all. The skin doesn't shed at all. So remember EM, erythema multiform, minor, no mucose, no mucosal involvement. Major has mucosal involvement. Both of them have negative Nikolsky sign. That's going to be important for other conditions that we get to differentiate it from. Okay, here's another picture. What one of two dermatologic conditions could this be? So as you see, that shedding of the skin, this would be a positive Nikolsky sign here. What, two, what one of two dermatologic conditions could this be, depending on the body surface area, right? Total body surface area. So what would you call it if he had 8% total body surface area involved? What would that condition be called? How about if he had 28%? How about if he had 38%? So the total body surface area involved in this condition matters, and it matters what the diagnosis is going to be. What other anticonvulsant is an important cause? We already said phenytoin and phenobarbital, but another important one that I've gotten a lot of questions of um, is also an anticonvulsant um, and is a cause of one of these two conditions. What is this physical exam sign called? So we already talked about that. What is this physical exam sign called? So this is going to be SJS, Stephen Johnson syndrome, if it's under 10%. So that first one who had 8%, that would be SJS, Stephen Johnson syndrome. The, the next one who had 28% of the total body surface area involved, that's going to be SJS slash 10. So they just call it SJS slash 10 if it's 10 to 30%. And then toxic epidermal necrolysis, TEN, 10 if over 30%. So it's on a continuum. SJS is the least, then SJS slash 10, 10 to 30, and then TEN, again, to toxic epidermal necrolysis, necrolysis, if over 30%, total body surface area. And that's lamotrigine. So that other medication, anticonvulsant, that can cause this is lamotrigine. Important to know. Again, Nikolsky sign. And don't forget SJS and TEN, 10, are also involved at least one mucous membrane. Erythema multiform is no Nikolsky's, but yes, mucosal involvement. That's major, right? And erythema multiform minor has no mucosal involvement. And again, no Nikolsky sign. Okay, next one. Here we have what we call circular discrete patches of complete hair loss tapering near the proximal hair shaft, as they might describe it. So again, tapering near the proximal hair shaft. So you can see here, discrete patches of hair loss tapering near the proximal hair shaft, so proximal nearest to the scalp. As, as you can see, it tapers down. What is, this, what is this sign called? What is this condition? What is the path, pathognomonic sign seen in this second picture here? What is this sign called? And what other abnormality would we see? What other bodily abnormality would we see in this condition? And also, what is the treatment? So there's a specific treatment that we can do for this. So this is going to be alopecia areata. Alopecia areata. These are exclamation point hairs in the second one, exclamation point hairs, because they look like an exclamation point, as we said, that tapering towards the proximal hair shaft. And this has a proposed mechanism of autoimmune in nature, autoimmune, 
and also nail dystrophy. So nail involvement seen with pitting of the nails. And we want to treat this with, with intralesional corticosteroid injections. So we actually want to inject the area pretty superficially um, that's having this because it is autoimmune and it's attacking that specific area. So again, intralesional corticosteroids for alopecia areata. And don't forget that they're also going to have nail involvement too. So nail pitting, nail involvement. Next one, what is this? So you, as you can see, they're both having some hair loss in this midline distribution. What is this condition called? What is the key hormone in this condition? What is the first line and second line treatment of this condition? So again, what is it called? What is the key hormone in this condition? What is the first and second line and how do they work? So this is androgenic alopecia. Androgenic alopecia, DHT, dihydrotestosterone, is the important hormone that we should know. It makes the growth phase shorter and miniaturizes the follicles overall. So this appears as hair loss. So again, makes the growth phase shorter and miniaturizes the follicles, DHT. First line treatment is minoxidil. However, it takes four to six months to work. How it works is it dilates the scalp vessels to provide more growth factors um, and cellular stuff to that hair follicle so it can grow. And then of course, the second line, finasteride. Finasteride, which we use for prostate as well. So finasteride, it's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. It inhibits testosterone's conversion to DHT. So it keeps it as testosterone as opposed to converting it to DHT, which is the problem hormone for and androgenic alopecia. Next one, what is this? As we can see, some discrepancy on the nail here. What is this called? What is the most common cause of this? What must we do before treatment? And what is the most sensitive test? And also, what is the treatment? So again, see the picture? What is the most common cause? What do we need to do before treatment? Most sensitive test and treatment. So this is onychomycosis, toe fungus. The most common cause is T. rubrum. T. rubrum, trichophyton rubrum. Must confirm, since the treatment is systemic antifungals and it has side effects of hepatotoxicity. So remember, the antifungals have a lot of bad side effects, especially hepatotoxicity. So we always want to test first. And the best test is going to be periodic acid shift test. So the best test is PAS, periodic acid shift test. And we can also do a KOH smear or a KOH prep if we need to. But the PAS, the periodic acid shift, is the best. And it, um, for this treatment, terbenafine. So terbenafine is the treatment for onychomycosis. Okay, what is this condition here? What is the most common cause? What do we do if there's no abscess that has really formed and it's pretty mild? What are we going to treat it with? And what if we do have an abscess here? What is it? So again, see around the nail fold here. This is a paronychia. Paronychia. Staph aureus is the most common cause of paronychia. If it's mild and there's no really abscess forming yet, we can just do warm water and antiseptic soap soaks in topical antibiotics because it is staph aureus. So topical antibiotics such as mupiracin. Um, and if it's worse and it progresses to an abscess, we can do oral cephalexin or dicloxacillin and also incision and drainage, incision and drainage of this area and to express all that pus out and to prevent it from formulating into a, what is this? So what is this condition here? So this is going to be a felon. It is the same treatment and cause, and it can progress from a paronychia. So a paronychia can progress to a felon, and this typically occurs after paronychia or direct trauma to that uh, bed of the finger. Next one. What is this? What is this condition? What is this violin mark on the spider? What does that uh, make you think of? And it's described as a red halo and a hemorrhagic bulla that undergoes eschar formation. So red halo and a hemorrhagic bulla that undergoes eschar formation. What type of spider bite is this? So what spider is this? What venom type is this? So this is going to be a brown recluse spider bite. So remember the violin sign, the violin mark on the spider, and the spider's brown after all. It's a brown recluse spider bite. The venom is cytotoxic and hemolytic, and it can progress to necrosis as well. So important to know cytotoxic and hemolytic and can progress to necrosis. You want to do wound, wound debridement and pain control, but there's no real antivenom that you can use for this condition. 
um, and you can do tetanus too. Next one, what spider is this? So there's only two spiders you need to know. What spider is this? Venom is what type of damage and how do we treat this one? So we said the previous one was cytotoxic and hemolytic and that differs from the, from the black widow spider. So this is a black widow spider bite. It has a red hourglass shape characteristically. So red hourglass shape and the previous one, the brown recluse had a violin shape. This one, the, brown, uh, the black widow has neurotoxic venom neurotoxic. It can cause muscle pain and spasm. You can also do a muscle relaxant and you may need antivenom to non-responders. So again, muscle relaxant, neurotoxic, and muscle spasm with the black widow red hourglass shape. Okay, next one. What is this? You see the rash on the face, lace-like rash on the extremities. What is this condition? What is its cause? What is seen in older children and adults? So what if this occurs in an older child or an adult? What would we more characteristically see? What two populations are at increased risk for complications? So that's an important one. I've been asked many times. What two populations are at increased risk for complications? And what is the progression of symptoms? So there's a, there's a specific um, sequence of symptoms that these patients experience with this rash. So that's going to be erythema infectiosum or fifth disease. It's caused by parvovirus B19. It can lead to, in older children and adults, arthralgias, more importantly. The two populations that are at risk are people who are pregnant, and they can have an increased risk for miscarriage. And also patients with G6PD and sickle cell disease are at risk for an aplastic crisis. So really patients who are pregnant and patients who have G6PD or sickle cell due to that aplastic crisis. So the progression of symptoms in erythema infectiosum or fifth disease is first the viral URI symptoms like cough, runny nose, etc. Viral URI symptoms, and then a slapped cheek appearance of the rash, slapped cheek rash, circumoral paler around the mouth, and then a lacy reticular maculopapular rash on the extremities. Again, lacy reticular maculopapular rash on the extremities, and that's what this is considered. Okay, next one. What is this condition here? What is this condition? What are the three C's that you have to know, which kind of gives it away? What are the three C's? Describe what might be found in the mouth of this patient. What might be found in the mouth? Where does this rash spread from? So where does the rash start? They'll often give you that fact in, more, in, uh, in order to differentiate it from other similar rashes. How long does this last? And what are two complications we should know? So important to know, how long does this rash typically last and what are the two complications we should know? One that has a higher mortality and one that is just the most common. So this is measles. This is measles, rubiola, not rubella, rubiola. It's a paramyxovirus family as a cause, has a prodrome of a fever. And then the three C's are cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis. So don't forget the three C's for measles, cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis. What will we see in the mouth of this patient? That'll be coplic spots, and that's pathognomonic. So coplic spots, these are classically described as a small one to three millimeter pale white or blue papules with erythematous base on the buccal mucosa. So again, pale white or blue papules on the buccal mucosa. It spreads from the hairline centrifugally. It's like in a centrifuge from inside to outside. It's morbilliform and brick red. So morbilliform and brick red. It lasts seven days, the rash does. So the rash lasts seven days. Diarrhea is the most common complication, but the most severe is pneumonia, which is the most common cause of death from measles. So again, have to know those three C's, coplic spots. It's important to know that it spreads from the hairline down. They'll often say, they started with the rash that spread right under their hairline, and now it's spread to their thorax. What is this? So again, hair, hairline centrifugally, which means outwardly from the middle, morbilliform and brick red, and it lasts typically seven days. Next one, what is this condition? As we can see, these small vesicles on the foot here, hand around the outside of the oral mucosa. And on the outside of the hand here, what is this? What is the most common cause of this condition? What is an enanthem versus an exanthem? 
So which one and which one is painful in these kids here? This is going to be hand foot mouth disease. So of course we have a picture of a hand, a foot and a mouth here. So little vesicles on each of those, highly contagious. And it's caused by Coxsackie A virus. So important to know Coxsackie A virus for hand foot mouth disease. It's most commonly commu um, communicated, uh, communicable between kids in, in the summer and early fall and typically in under five years old. So very high incidence in like daycares. The exanthem is outside the mouth and it's not painful. Whereas the enanthem is inside the mouth and it is painful. So that's why they typically have decreased feeding or not wanting to eat anything. And that might clue you into it to look into their mouth, look on their hands and feet and see if they have this condition. So how I remember it is exanthem is like exterior, so outside. So exanthem is anything outside the mouth and it's also not painful. So they're not gonna be having pain in their hands or feet here with these exanthems. But enanthem is painful and that's why they don't wanna eat with this condition. So they have decreased feeding. So they might say painful oral vesicles surrounded by a thin halo of erythema. So painful oral vesicles surrounded by a thin halo of erythema. And again, Coxsackie A virus causes this. Next one, what is this? So as we can see, these white surrounded by an erythematous base on the posterior pharynx. What is this? What is the most common cause of this? What is the most common symptom arising in these patients? So what is this a characteristic thing of? So that's going to be painful, small, yellow, white vesicular lesions on the posterior pharynx. Also, remember the posterior pillars. They might say the tonsils. Anything in the posterior pharynx or the palate there is going to be uh, where, these, where this condition arises. And this is herpangina. And this is Coxsackie A, again, and also anorexia with a high fever. So hand, foot, mouth disease didn't necessarily have a high fever, but this one will have a high fever as well as anorexia because these are painful things on the back of their pharynx here. Painful ulcerations, white, yellow, vesicular lesions. Okay, what is this condition here? A little bit generalized, erythematous, poorly demarcated. What is this condition? What is the most common cause? Exactly what tissue is involved? And a cat bite would lead to what bacterial infection? So it's important to know they might say, this patient got bit by a cat. What is the bacteria that infected them? And what is the treatment for that too? So it's important to know the treatment. What are some potential treatments? So what are some potential treatments of this? So again, what is it? What is the most common cause? Exactly what tissue is involved? A cat bite would lead to a bacterial infection with what? And what is the treatment? And what are some potential treatments of this condition overall, even if it was not a cat bite? So that's cellulitis. Um, strep A is the most common cause, actually, not Staph aureus, although it can be Staph aureus. Strep A is the most common cause of cellulitis, so important to know. Strep A for cellulitis. The deeper dermis and subcutaneous layer is, is what uh, is affected in cellulitis, and that spreads and is not sharply demarcated. So if you think the dermis and the subcutaneous layer are, are deeper down, so if they sh they're going to be shining through the dermis and the epidermis, so that's going to be a a poorly demarcated condition. It's going to be very vague in its uh, borders there. So again, cellulitis not sharply demarcated. If they have a cat bite, you want to be thinking pastorella multisita, pastorella multisita, and you want to use augmentin, uh, amoxicillin clavulanate for that. So again, pastorella multisita for cat bite and augmentin is the treatment. For cellulitis in general, for strep A or potentially staph aureus, you can do a first gen cephalosporin. Um, Dicloxacillin, you can do, if MRSA suspected, doxycycline, clindamycin, Bactrim orally, or VANC or linazolid IV. So again, VANC or linazolid IV, only time you do VANC orally is C. diff, and you can do Bactrim orally, clinda, and doxy from MRSA. Next one, what is this condition? So here's two different pictures of it. You can see it's extremely red, well demarcated, so a little bit different than cellulitis. Similar to cellulitis, however, what is this condition? What is the tissue that's involved as well? So this is erysipelas. So erysipelas, a variant of cellulitis that contains the upper dermis and cutaneous lymph nodes as well. Group A strep is also the most common, could be staph aureus, but group A strep is typically the most common for erysipelas. And it's raised and sharply demarcated. And it's most commonly on the legs or as well as the face. So again, raised, as you can see here, raised 
and sharply demarcated. So you see exactly where the red starts and where the normal skin begins. So sharply demarcated and raised as opposed to cellulitis, which is poorly demarcated. Next one, what is this condition? So we can see a linear streak, a red erythematous linear streak here. What is this condition? What is it common after? What is this uh, predisposed to this condition? This is lymphangitis. Lymphangitis after cellulitis is most common. Streaks of redness followed proximally through the path of the lymph nodes. Treat for the underlying cellulitis. So again, the bacteria are spreading through the lymph system and you can see the um, erythematous eruption through the skin here in a streaking pattern, lymphangitis. Next one, what is the difference between a furuncle and a carbuncle? So what is the difference between a furuncle and a carbuncle? What is the most common cause and what is the treatment for these conditions? So again, most common cause of furuncle and carbuncle and treatment. Furuncle is a deep infection of the hair follicle where a carbuncle is several furuncles. So carbuncle is several furuncles. How I remember that is car. You can fit many people in a car so that several furuncles can fit in a car, a carbuncle. Um, Staph aureus is the most common. You may just do incision and drainage without antibiotics, but antibiotics um, you want to do if it's associated with a cellulitis or progresses to that cellulitis. But again, you can still do incision drainage. So if they give you that as an option, you can just do incision and drainage for this. Okay, what is this condition? A very classic one. As you can see, this kid here, I don't want to describe the lesions quite yet, which gives it away. What is this condition? What are the three types of this condition? There's three different types. What is the treatment? Important to know. And what is an important but rare side effect known based on the second most common cause? Interesting. So what is a rare side effect to know based on the second most common cause? So you have to know the first and then the second most common cause of this condition here. So this is, of course, impetigo. This is honey-crusted or gold-crusted lesions on the face, peroorally. Again, impetigo, honey-crusted or gold-crusted lesions. It can be three different types, so non-bullous in this picture, where you can see it's kind of like flaking. It could also be bullous, and it could also be ecthyma, ecthyma, which is rare, punched-out, ulcerative type of strep A infection there. So ecthyma punched out. So again, scaling, which is non-bullous, can be bullous, or it could be ecthyma, punched out, ulcerative type. Most common cause is uh, strep A, and uh, actually most common cause is staph aureus, but strep A is an important cause because it can cause secondary glomerulonephritis. So remember, strep can cause glomerulonephritis. It can also cause it if it's causing impetigo as well. So you think of like a strep pharyngitis, it can cause glomerulonephritis after. But you should also be thinking of glomerulonephritis as a rare cause um, if this is indeed caused by strep A. And the treatment is topical mupirocin, or you can do also if it's really severe oral cephalexin um, cephalosporin there. So again, topical mupirocin, most common cause is staph aureus, but second most common cause is strep A. So we should be thinking glomerulonephritis for that. Okay, name that lesion. So this is, I'm just going to describe a lesion and you have to name what is the dermatologic term for it. Just helps you give a better understanding of what they're actually talking about. And uh, these aren't super important to know, but it does help you if they're giving you a question, they don't give you any picture, but they just start to describe it with a bunch of dermatologic terms. So you can at least uh, start to formulate a picture in your mind of what that condition might be. So first one, what is a flat, non-palpable lesion under 10 millimeters? So a small, flat, non-palpable lesion, you can only see it. What is a flat, non-palpable lesion that's over 10 millimeters? So the same thing, except just a little bit bigger. How about a solid, raised lesion that's small, under 5 millimeters in diameter, or a solid, raised lesion that's larger, over 5 millimeters in diameter? How about a raised, flat top lesion over 10 millimeters? Raised, flat topped lesion. How about a circumscribed, elevated, fluid-filled lesion that's small, under 5 millimeters? Or a circumscribed, circular, elevated, fluid-filled lesion that's over 5 millimeters? If it's pus-filled, um, a pus-filled vesicle or bulla, what is that called? A pus-filled vesicle or bulla, it's called what? 
or another name for that is what? Transient elevation in a lesion with local edema. So transient elevated lesion with local edema is called what? Typically from an allergic reaction. And lastly, small punctate hemorrhages that don't blanch are called what? Small punctate hemorrhages that don't blanch. Okay, and the answers are flat non-palpable lesion under 10 millimeters is a simple macule. Flat non-palpable lesions over 10 millimeters is a patch. So a little bit bigger, macule patch. Solid ra raised lesions under 5 millimeters is a papule. And a little bit bigger, over 5 millimeters is a nodule. So a papule and nodule, same thing, just different in size. A raised flat topped lesion over 10 millimeters, that's a plaque. So raised and it's flat topped. So you want to be thinking plaque with flat top lesion. Circumscribed, elevated, fluid filled lesion that's small is a little vesicle. Circumscribed, elevated, fluid filled lesion over 5 millimeters is bulla. So vesicle and bulla of the same uh, category. Vesicle is smaller, bulla is bigger. And if it's pus filled vesicle or a bulla, it can be a pustule. So a bulla or a vesicle itself can just be regular fluid filled, doesn't have to be pus. But if it is pus filled, then you want to be calling it a pustule. Transient elevated lesion with local edema, that's a wheel. That could be seen in urticaria, for instance. So that's a wheel. And lastly, small punctate hemorrhages that do not blanch are called petechiae. So petechiae. Okay, continuing along, what is this condition here? So what is this condition here? You can see a circular lesion on the hair, and this is a more severe form of it. If it progresses, what is this also called? So these are called slightly different things. What is this specifically called here? What is the lesion above called? How about the condition to the right on the second picture? So what is this exactly called? And also going into the next one, what is this condition called, which is the same condition actually? What is the treatment for this condition? What to be aware of? for the treatment of this condition? What do we need to be aware of? And what is the cause overall of this condition? And what is this called? This is a little black dot pattern here on the hair. So this is tinea capitis, or ringworm of the scalp basically. Tinea capitis has that black dot pattern. Importantly, the black dot pattern will be seen, especially in that third picture. The second picture right here is a carry-on, which is a severe form of it of tinea capitis, a carry-on. And the most common cause is trichophyton. Trichophyton is the most common cause. You want to be careful of hepatic failure. We know that antifungals have a um, hepatic risk, but hepatic failure, especially when treating first line with griseofulvin. So you want to treat tinea capitis with griseofulvin. And again, orally. So first line, oral griseofulvin for this treatment of tinea capitis. Few questions about the tinea infections. What is the first line treatment for tinea pedis? Tinea pedis, what is the first line treatment? So tinea of the foot. Tinea cruris, what is tinea cruris and what is the treatment? How do we diagnose all tinea infections? What is a pruritic circular or oval plaque that has central clearing as well as defined raised borders that spread outwardly? What is that also? Okay, so this is tinea pedis, which needs topical antifungals. So remember, pedis of the foot, you can use topical antifungals. Um, gruris, cruris, tinea cruris is also called jock itch or groin or inner thigh, tinea cruris. Also topical can be used for these two areas. So the foot, um, as well as the groin, you can use topical antifungals. All of them should do KOH prep first. And again, we already said um, the periodic acid shift test was the best for for that toenail um, onychomycosis, but for this, for tinea, you can do KOH prep first. And that last one is tinea corporis, so ringworm classically on the body. Corpus, body. So tinea corporis is on the body. Again, pruritic uh, circular oval plaque that has central clearing, as well as defined raised borders that spreads outwardly. That's ringworm. Okay, next one. What is this condition here? What is the most common cause? What is seen on the best test? What is the treatment? And what is the classic description? What is the classic description of this? What do they call this on a vignette? If you don't actually see this picture, what do they call this? As you can see, these satellite lesions, classically, and macerated plaques here. So what do they call this? What is the treatment? What is the best test? What is seen on that? And what is the most common cause? 
So this is intertrigo. It's seen in the intertriginous areas, areas where skin folds are, skin areas are touching each other that can get sweaty and bacteria and fungus can grow. Candida species is the most common, so it's candidal infection. On KOH prep, you see budding yeast with or without pseudohyphae. And for treatment, you can do topical azoles like ketoconazole, fluconazole, um, clotrimazole, or you can also do nystatin as well. And the classic description of this is, we already said some of it, erythematous beefy red macerated plaques with satellite lesions. So important to know those satellite lesions, which are, which are these little dots here, like little satellites around and away from the main plaque here. So erythematous beefy red macerated plaques. And risk factor for this is important to know immunocompromised like HIV or diabetes. So next one, what is this? So as you can see, some linear areas here. What is this condition? What is the classic description of this condition? What is the first line and second line treatment for this? How do we make the diagnosis? And what is the patient education? So again, what is this classic description, first and second line, diagnosis and patient education for this condition? So this is scabies, Sarcoptes scabii, intensely itchy at night with linear burrows. So important to know, the classic symptom is intensely itchy at night, and these are called linear burrows. So typically in a line here, the mites um, basically excavate underneath the surface of the skin there. So they're in the web spaces and also intertriginous zones. For diagnosis, you want to get skin scrapings and look at them under microscope. So you can just scrape it off, look at it under a microscope. The treatment, the first line treatment is permethrin, permethrin 5% cream. 5% cream. It's important to know it's 5% as we'll use 1% for a different condition. And the permethrin must stay on for a while before showering. So you want to keep it on hours before you actually take a shower. Lindane is a second line, but don't use it after a hot shower, especially in kids, because it can cause seizures due to increased absorption through the open pores. So it's neurotoxic if it gets absorbed. All clothing for patient education and bedding should be placed in a plastic bag for 72 hours and then washed and dried using heat and also treating all contacts as well. So again, those linear burrows, do a skin scraping, treat with 5% permethrin cream for scabies. Okay, what is this condition? And also, what is the treatment for this condition? And what is the most common complaint? So what is this, what is the treatment, and what is the most common complaint? So that's gonna be lice, pediculosis. Permethrin 1% is the treatment, as opposed to 5%. And this is itching, is the most common cause. And if you look and use a fine tooth comb in the hair, you may also see the nits. You may also see these white little dots, which are the nits of the lice. And last one before we take a break, what is this? What is the classic description of this? And what is the treatment? So this is a very classic one here. What is it? Classic description, what is the treatment? So that's gonna be molluscum contagiosum. The classic description is single or many firm dome-shaped, flesh-colored to pearly white waxy papules of two to five millimeters with importantly central umbilication. So know the central umbilication with these molluscum contagiosum. And this is a viral infection. No treatment is needed. It may resolve in a few months, but you could do cryotherapy if it's really bothering them and freeze them off. So that's molluscum contagiosum. Okay, so we'll take a break for here and we'll continue along in the second video for the dermatology practice questions.